Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to AJ 102 Introduction to Criminal Justice. My name is Tony Farrar, and of course, I am your instructor for this semester. So this week's lecture, we're going to cover punishment and sentencing, and we'll take a look at the history of punishment. We'll look at some goals of punishment, uh, sentencing, some of the different sentence models, capital punishment. So a lot to cover. So let's go ahead and just jump right into this week's lecture. So again, we're going to talk about punishment and sentencing. So, and this picture should probably is a good place to start when we talk about punishment, especially or prison life or anything relative to corrections in the United States, because we do tend to sentence more people to prison in the U.S. than we do anywhere else. So with that said, what are some of our learning objectives? Well, to describe the historical development of punishment, list some of the major goals of contemporary sentencing, distinguish among general and specific deterrence, because there are two types of deterrence, incapacitation and retribution, and what do those four different terms mean? Uh, compare rehabilitation with just desert, meaning like we're going to punish you because you deserve it. Explain how sentences are imposed. Classify the various types of sentencing structures. Discuss how people are sentenced today. Take a look at capital punishment in the United States and abroad. Articulate the arguments um, for and against capital punishment. And then finally, discuss the legality of the death penalty. So again, a lot to cover. Okay. So with that being said, the punishment and correction of criminals has changed considerably through the ages, ages uh, reflecting things like custom or economic conditions and even religious and political views and ideals. Now, historically, people who have violated the law were considered morally corrupt and in the need of strong discipline. In early Greece and Rome, the most common state administered punishment was what they used to refer to as banishment or exile. Um, so they would make you leave whatever place. You have Basically, they would force you to leave your community, etc. Now, in the Middle Ages, um, Old English common law punished misdemeanors with things like public floggings or whipping. And, and the reason they did it in public, and you can see the picture down here with like the stocks, if you will. So it was kind of like public humiliation. This was the pain part. And this was a little bit of pain, but not as much. It was more humiliation. But it was done to basically detour crime, right? So if we do this public thing, then maybe you won't, you won't commit crime. Now, Old English common law punished felonies. That penalty was, you know, obviously a lot more harsh or worse because it included things like the death penalty, uh, beheadings, uh, hangings, or even burning at the stake. So we can see that there, you know, things were a lot worse when it came to to felonies. Now, during this period the main emphasis of criminal law and punishment was to maintain public order. And the development of common law in the 11th century brought some standardization, if you will, to penal practices. However, corrections remained kind of a, you know, kind of a mixture of fines and brutal punishment. Um, and, and, and the criminally wealthy could actually buy their way out of punishment, uh, severe punishment, if you will, and into exile. So you wouldn't be killed, but you might actually be, uh, you know, bun uh, you know, punished by by exile. So you would have to leave the area or or you know where you were at, etc. And you know, uh, kind of talking a little bit more on on something like this. Um, you know, execution, banishment, mutilation, branding, flogging uh, were all used 
on a, on a, a kind of a wide range of offenders, if you will, from murderers and robbers to vagrants and gypsies. And punishments became basically unmatched in their cruelty, Fear, you know, kind of featuring a gruesome variety of physical torture, again, often part of a public spectacle, presumably, again, so that, you know, these sadistic sanctions would be kind of a deterrent. So that's why they did it in public. So people found guilty of crimes faced a wide variety of, of punishment. Uh, you know, physical torture, branding, whipping, and again, death for, for most felony suspects. Now, at the end of the 16th century, uh, many offenders were made to do hard labor for their crimes. And they had something that was referred to at that time called poor laws. Uh, developed at the end of the 16th century, required that the poor, vagrants, etc., be put to work in private enterprise. And in England, transporting convicts to the colonies became very, very popular. So we have, you know, some different things that are that are kind of happening now. By 1820, um, there were long periods of incarceration in walled institutions called reformatories or penitentiaries. Um, and they began to replace the physical punishment in England and even in the United States. And a, pen a penitentiary by definition is what they would call a place to do penance or to kind of think about what you've done, right? Does that kind of make sense? And, and a state or federal correctional institution for incarceration of a felony offenders uh, for more than one year. So this would be a penitentiary, a place to do penance, to think about what you've done, to pay your penance, to pay your price, if you will. Um, and this would be a state or federal correctional institution for incarceration of a felony offender for typically more than one year. And if you don't recognize the photo here, this would be Alcatraz Island. Um, so this was a penitentiary as well. And one thing that was kind of cool about Alcatraz, I was there actually when they were filming the movie The Rock with Sean Connery. So that was actually kind of a cool thing. I got to watch him kind of do some scenes and things like that. They had part of the uh, island closed off for filming, but it was kind of a cool deal. Um, anybody recognize where this one is? So this would be Rikers Island in New York. Um, so this would be another type of of penitentiary, if you will. Um, and so, and they, you can see that it's, you know, right off of, right off the water right here, just like this one, presumably for escape rationale, but also to keep the prisoners, you know, in the, in the penitentiary isolated, not in the center of the city, etc. Okay. So with that being said, what now would be some goals of punishment? So when we hear about a you know, not nor notorious criminal, like a bad criminal, right? Receiving a long prison sentence or the death penalty for a particular, you know, heinous, violent crime. Each of us has kind of a distinct reaction. And some of us, you know, have a, gra you know, we're gratified, if you will, that a truly evil person kind of got what they deserved. And many people feel safer because a dangerous person is now, quote, where they can't harm anyone anymore, you know, end quote. And, and others hope that the punishment serves as an example or warning to others who might want to do that same crime, right? And some even feel sad. Uh, the person needs help, maybe, um, you know, not some type of, of punishment. So we all feel maybe a little bit different on, on how that is, um, you know, when it comes to somebody being convicted of a crime or something like that. Um, you know, others hope the punishment, again, serves as a warning for potential criminals that, you know, everyone who gets caught, you know, or everybody does get caught in the end, and, and so you're going to get yours. And any of these thoughts or sentiments may be at work when criminal sentences are formulated. After all, 
punishments are devised and implemented by judges, many of whom are elected officials and share the general public sentiments and fears. And the objectives, again, of criminal sentencing today can usually be grouped into six different distinct areas. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about right now. So still under the goals of punishment, but we're going to talk about the objectives of criminal sentencing. Okay. And they can be grouped into these different areas. Um, so let's kind of look at them. So we have general deterrence. We have incapacitation, we have specific deterrence, uh, retribution or just deserts or just desert, if you will, uh, rehabilitation, diversion, equity and restitution, and then restoration. So these are some of the areas that these sentencings can be can be grouped under. So let's talk first about general deterrence. So according to the the concept of general deterrence, people should be punished to set an example for others. So, you know, and, and if someone is punished severely, maybe others will be too afraid to break the law knowing that they will face similar treatment, right? So that's kind of an interesting thought process. And if the state can convince potential criminals that pun that, that punishment that, you know, they will face is certain, swift, and severe, they will be too afraid to commit the crime. But along with that, punishment can't be so harsh that it seems um, kind of disproportionate, right, or unfair. So, you know, you know and, and if it did, people would believe that they really have nothing to lose. So they don't want it to be, you know, unfair. They want the punishment to fit the crime. Because if it was too harsh, then really people would basically say, hey, I have nothing to lose. So, you know, maybe crimes could go up, right? So you want to make it certain, swift, and severe so that people would be too afraid to actually commit crime. And that's kind of the definition of general deterrence, a crime control policy that basically depends on the fear of criminal penalties, right? General deterrence measures you know, such as long prison sentences for violent crimes are aimed at convincing potential violators that the pains associated with that crime outweigh the benefits of the crime. So hopefully that kind of makes sense, right? So again, some justice experts believe that the decline in crime rates is due to increasing criminal penalties. And once arrested, People have a greater chance of being convicted today than they ever did in the past. And this unique phenomenon, if you will, is referred to as expected punishment, described as the number of days that a typical criminal can expect to serve per crime. And there was a kind of a, a, a paper that was put out by the U.S. Department of Justice um, Office of Justice Programs back in 2016 that talks about the actual time served in state prison uh, by inmates. And, and here, when we talk about deterrence, right, um, or we talk about, you know, methods of um, executions, because we are going to start to talk about capital punishment and thing, things later on. But here you can look at, I thought it'd be interesting, when we look at the total number of executions in the U.S. Um, since 1700, and this chart goes all the way up into uh, 2000, if you will. But um, you can see the different type, right? So whether it was burning at the stake. And you can see some of the orange as you kind of look in here. Uh, firing squad, hanging, the gas chamber, electrocution, lethal injection, or even other, which might be right here. Um, so, so kind of interesting, right? Um, and then it gives you the numbers as well as we as we kind of go through here. So and then when we talk about deterrence, um, I always like to put this slide in here because this shows murder rates in death penalty states and non death penalty states. So you would think, right, if we're going to talk about deterrence, meaning that it, the, the penalty is so bad that maybe you won't want to do this crime, 
Um, but then if you look at murder rates in those states that have the death penalty versus non-death penalty, and it's it, it's interesting, right? So really is, you know, is having the death penalty a deterrent? Um, or are there other reasons for having the death penalty? I mean, so just, you know, just food for thought as we, as we look at and talk about some of these different things. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about um, incapacitation. So because criminals will not be able to repeat their criminal acts while they're under control, right, while they're in prison, incapacitation of criminals is another goal of sentencing. So for some offenders, this means a period in, let's say, a high security state prison where behavior is closely monitored. And if dangerous criminals are kept behind bars, then of course they will not be able to repeat their illegal activities, right? So, I mean, you know, the kind of the overriding question, does incapacitating criminals help reduce the crime rate? So that's always kind of an interesting question that we really should ask ourselves. So by definition, incapacitation, the policy of keeping dangerous criminals in confinement to eliminate the risk of them repeating their offenses in society. But I asked the question, so here it is, does keeping those criminals, you know, incapacitated in a prison, a jail, et cetera, help reduce the crime rate? Well, the evidence is kind of a little bit mixed. So, um, you know, when you talk about preventing crime by keeping offenders under state control, between 1990 and 2014, the prison population doubled from 700,000, there should be another zero there, to more than 1.5 million, and the crime rate dropped significantly during that time, indicating, right, the incarceration effect. So it appeared to kind of, you know, maybe work. However, there have also been periods such as in 1980 to 1990 when the prison population increased, but so did the crime rate. Our highest crime rates were actually in, in the 1990s. So this means that there might be some type of other factors that are kind of at play, right? Um, and, and, you know, and, and so that could be some other th trends that might influence the crime rates. Um, so maybe uh, the population makeup, uh, police effectiveness, uh, drug use, maybe the economy. Um, you know, and it is also possible that incarceration could have a kind of a short term effect, reducing crime while the person is behind bars, but uh, that this effect quickly ends once that person is released out to the community. So these are just some some other things, right? And that prison experience itself may actually increase the likelihood of reoffending. Many inmates have, you know, have not engaged in any correctional rehabilitation, and others are exposed to highly dangerous, um, experienced of offenders. And and this produces kind of a criminogenic effect, if you will, increasing the likelihood of their offending once they're released back, you know, kind of back into the community. So, so there really, really is a lot to kind of think about. Uh, but we talked about, you know, some of these factors that have this influence. So population, uh, police effective, effectiveness, drug use, the economy, and the fact that these things could diminish over time. Okay. So, so a lot for us to kind of consider, right? Now we have specific deterrence. And this is a crime control policy suggesting that punishment should be severe enough to convince convicted offenders never to repeat their criminal activity. So remember general, you know, deterrence was talking more about, hey, you know, these, the, these other people are punished, um, you know, so severely that maybe we don't want to commit the crime, right? It's the policy, again, that depends on the fear of criminal penalties. Things like, you know, a long prison sentence, um, you know, etc. But here we have something, you know, a crime control policy suggesting that punishment should be so severe 
that were going to convince the convicted person never to repeat their criminal activity. So the question is, does this work? Well, again, the evidence is kind of mixed. A few research studies show that, you know, experiencing punishment can have a significant specific effect on future criminality. But these findings are also balanced by studies that show it has failed to, you know, kind of reduce reoffending. So, yeah, again, kind of another mixed bag when you talk about specific deterrence. So, you know, how is it possible that harsh sentences actually increase the likelihood of future crime? Well, punishment may bring defiance rather than deterrence. The stigma of harsh treatment labels people, right? Prisoners, convicts, etc., and helps lock offenders into that criminal career. Well, I'm already a convict, you know, or whatever they call me, so, you know, or a parolee or whatever, so I might as well just stay a parolee and commit more crimes. And then criminals who are punished may also believe the likelihood of getting caught twice for the same type of crime is remote. Hey, lightning don't strike in the same place twice, right? So I'll just, I, you know, I learned my lesson, but I'm going to go back and do it again because I, I can't get caught again, right? The likelihood of me getting caught for this twice. So, you know, again, kind of an interesting thing. Another goal of punishment, retribution. Now, according to the retributive goal of sentencing, the essential person, you know, or purpose of the criminal process is to punish people fairly and justly, of course, in a manner that is proportionate, equal to the gravity of the crime. And here, offenders are punished because they deserve to be disciplined for what they've done. But again, the punishment really should uh, fit the crime, okay? Because it would be wrong to punish people to set an example for, you know, others or to deter would-be criminals as the general deterrence goal demands. At least that's what some people think or under this retribution uh, type theory, that's what it talks about. So punishment should be no more or, you know, no less than the offender's actions deserve. It must be based on how blameworthy the person is. And this is referred to as the concept of just desert. Okay. The philosophy of justice asserting that those who violate the rights of others deserve to be punished. But the severity of punishment should be equal to commensurate, if you will, with the seriousness of the crime. So hopefully those two definitions um, kind of make sense. So we have retribution and we have just desert. Well, and the next one would be rehabilitation. So some sentences are based on the need to treat and or rehabilitate criminal offenders. And, you know, because society has failed them, many offenders have been forced to basically grow up in disorganized neighborhoods, have been the target of biased police officers, and are disadvantaged at home, at school, and in the job market. And to compensate for this deprivation, if you will, the justice system is obligated to help these unfortunate individuals and not simply punishment for their, you know, punish them for their misdeeds, if you will. So rehabilitation advocates believe that if proper treatment is applied, an offender will present no further threat to society. Now, with that said, it's not surprising then that the general public supports the, the treatment goal of sentencing and prefers it over policies based on punishment and incarceration. But not everybody thinks that, right? Um, and not everybody thinks, you know, the poor me part. But understand, this is one of the goals of punishment is rehabilitation. 
And I know I said back early in, you know, when I was talking about rehabilitation, the fact that because society has failed them, it doesn't really, this is, again, this is what rehabilitation advocates advocate. It doesn't mean that everybody believes it, but rehabilitation basically says that the system is obligated to help these unfortunate individuals and not simply punish them. Then we have diversion. So in some instances, the court process is aimed at sparing non-dangerous offenders from the stigma and labeling of a criminal conviction and further involvement with the justice process. So this could mean that they could be diverted to a community correctional program for treatment. So example here in California, Penal Code 1000 of the California Penal Code talks about pretrial diversion. And in this particular law, it allows eligible defendants arrested for low-level drug crimes the opportunity to have their charges dismissed if they successfully complete drug treatment. And, you know, the legal ease part of this, you'll hear in court where the attorneys will be talking about PC-1000. And that's basically drug diversion and it's for drug treatment. Okay, and then there's another goal of punishment, which would be equity or restitution. So the action or practice of awarding each person his or her just due. And because criminals gain from their misdeeds, it seems both fair and just, you know, to demand that they reimburse society for its loss caused by their crime. So that's the restitution part. And equity is the action or practice of awarding each person his or her just due. It seeks to compensate individual victims and the general society for their losses due to crime. And then finally, we have restoration. And here, defendants may be asked to confront their behavior, if you will, the damage they caused the victim and the shame they brought to their family, friends, and community. And, and restoration really involves turning the justice system kind of into a healing process, if you will, rather than a distributor of retribution and or revenge. So ki kind of an interesting thought, right? Um, so, it, it, and it comes in a couple of different ways of, of presenting this. So um, we can kind of look at um, a restoration sentence might require that the convicted person recognize that he or she caused injury to a person, right? Along with a determination and acceptance of responsibility may be accompanied by a statement of remorse. So restoration, again, involves turning the system into kind of a healing process. Now, I know there were a lot of goals of punishment that we went over. And if you go to uh, page 433, I believe there's a chart kind of in the top in the middle of the page that talks about all of the goals of criminal sentencing. It has the sentencing goal on the left and then the purpose on the right. So you could take a look at that and... Um, you could kind of compare each one because they're kind of in a column, if you will. Well, and here it is right here. I didn't think I had it, but I do have it. So here's what you're going to find on that particular page. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit, a little bit about imposing the sentence. So in most felony cases, except where law provides for a mandatory prison term, sentencing is usually based on a variety of information available to the judge. Some jurisdictions allow victims to make statements that are considered at sentencing hearings, and these are called victim impact statements. Most judges also consider a pre-sentence investigative report by the probation department, and this report contains information regarding the defendant, including their criminal record, financial condition, and any other circumstances that may influence the defendant's future behavior. 
And this report also addresses what we call aggravating and mitigating circumstances. So those things that might be beneficial to the defendant and those things that might not be beneficial to the defendant. So a lot, you know, typically almost most judges that I know of are going to consider or look at that pre-sentence investigative report. Now, um, also, when you talk about imposing a sentence, in some instances, when the accused is convicted of two or more charges, the judge must decide whether to impose what they call consecutive or concurrent sentences. So just to kind of help you out a little bit, and I have a little chart here on the right, but concurrent sentences are served at the same time. So these are prison sentences for two or more criminal acts served simultaneously and they run together. That's concurrent. Okay. Consecutive sentences are served one after the other. So consecutive would be prison sentences for two or more criminal acts served one right after the other. All right, so here you have consecutive and here you have concurrent. Okay, so this little chart hopefully will help you by definition. And here it is a little bit larger and a little bit more clear. It's not quite as blurry as the other one. So hopefully this will help you understand the two different definitions. Now, when a judge imposes a, a sentence of incarceration, they do know and take into consideration the fact that the amount of time spent in prison is going to be reduced by the implementation of what we call time off for good behavior or more often known as good time. Now, state inmates can accrue standard good time at a rate of 10 to 15 days per month. And federal inmates can get almost 50 days off at the end of their sentence each year. And, you know, if you kind of think about it, you're probably going, well, why should they have any of this good time thing? Well, I mean, it really does act as maybe kind of an incentive, right? So if they behave better while they're incarcerated, then they're going to be able to collect these hours, which is going or days, and that's going to reduce their sentence. So it, it kind of makes sense while at first you think about it, and you're kind of going, why should anybody get any good time? But again, it does allow inmates to, um, you know, kind of incentivize um, the time that they're spending, but it also allows inmates to calculate their release time, if you will, or release date at the time they enter the prison system by subtracting that good time if they earn it, right? So again, it's kind of an incentivized type program. Okay, and then a couple of other terms as, we, as we're still looking at sentencing models would be what they call indeterminate sentences and determinate sentences. So an indeterminate sentence is a term of incarceration with a stated minimum and maximum length, such as a sentence to prison for a period of three to 10 years. And here the prisoner is eligible for parole after the minimum sentence has been served. And Indeterminate sentences provide a little bit of sentencing flexibility, and it is still the most widely used type of sentence in the, you know, in the U.S., if you will. Okay, so again, indeterminate sentence is a term of incarceration with a stated minimum and maximum length, again, such as 3 to 10. And the prisoner is eligible for, for parole, again, after the minimum sentence has been served. And, and here it's based on the belief that sentences should fit the, you know, kind of the, the criminal. 
So indeterminate sentences allow individualized sentences and provide a little bit of sentencing flexibility. So judges can set a high minimum to override the purpose of the indeterminate sentence. So uh, just a little bit of information on indeterminate sentence. So, so what about determinate then? So this is a fixed term of years to be served by the offender sentenced to prison for a particular crime. And it's viewed by many to be a little too restrictive for rehabilitation purposes. The advantage is that the offenders know exactly how much time they're going to serve because three years is three years, right? And it's kind of a one size fits all approach. But it does prohibit judges from tailoring sentences to the circumstances of the case. So you kind of lose a little bit of flexibility, right? Um, so while the individual knows how long they're going to serve, it still is kind of, um, you know, less flexible. So, um, you know, and when you talk about determinate sentences, they offer a fixed term of years again. Uh, the maximum is set, you know, basically in law by legislature to be served by the offender sentenced to prison for a particular crime, as I said before. So if the law provides for a sentence of up to 20 years for robbery, the judge might sentence a repeat offender to a 15 year term. Um, another less experienced felon might receive a more lenient sentence of five years. So you can see there's really, you can't really tailor it, right? Um, and whatever it is, is exactly what it is. Now, with that said, most courts have what we call sentencing guidelines. So in order to regulate the length of determinate sentences and curb judicial discretion, most jurisdictions that employ them have developed methods to structure and control the sentencing process and make it a little bit more rational. So a set of standards, this is what sentencing guidelines are, they're a set of standards that defines the parameters for trial judges to follow in their sentencing decisions. So it regulates the length of determinant sentences, it curbs that judicial discretion, and it's created by sentencing commissions. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. And one form of this is what they call the sentencing grid. So a sentencing grid, as you see on the right, is one method of guideline to create a grid with a prior record and current offense as the two coordinates um, and kind of net out specific punishments, right? So you might have, you know, the greater the offense severity and the greater the criminal history. So you're going to do one or, you know, based on where it is, if it falls in here, this would be the recommended stayed prison sentence in months. So it takes into account the prior record and the current offense. So it's kind of a grid, if you will. So ho hopefully that kind of makes sense, right? So that's what a sentencing grid. And in your textbook, they show you a sentencing grid as well based on, so you can look here, felony DUI, uh, their prior criminal history, and you can see that, you know, presumptive stayed sentence. Um, so it, it's kind of a grid system, if you will. Okay, so a couple of other things just to kind of go over before we uh, take our first break, if you will would be something, you know, some of the legal challenges and, and, and some of their impact. So there are several Supreme Court cases that have changed basically how guidelines can be used. And I'm not going to go through each case. You can look them, at, you know, look them up on your own, but you have um, Apprendi versus New Jersey, Blakely versus Washington, and United States versus Booker. And these are in your textbook, but to make it a little bit easier for you to look at, 
um, I put in the links to Oyez. And I'll see if this works. And Oyez is a really good website because what it does is it pulls up the case. You can listen to the oral arguments if you want to. It tells you when the case was argued. Remember, these are U.S. Supreme Court cases. Um, and then when the case was decided. But it makes it simple because here's the facts of the case. And then it tells you this is the question that the U.S. Supreme Court dealt with. Okay, so in this case, does the due process clause of the 14th Amendment require that any fact that increases the penalty for a crime beyond the prescribed statutory maximum be submitted to a jury and proved beyond a reasonable doubt? This was the question that the court looked at. And then they have the answer. And this was a close one. This was a five to four opinion, but the answer was yes. And it tells you why. And it also tells you which justice voted which way. So I like Oyez because it really does help you cut through all the red legal, the red tape and legal ease. But these are some, you know, basic legal challenge cases and their impact. And while these cases did not outline, you know, they didn't outlaw the guidelines, but rather they ruled that changes were needed in the way that they were administered. OK, so just, you know, kind of note that there are some legal cases that were out there. All right. So this is a good place and a good time for us to take our first break. So we're going to stop here for part one and then we'll come back in a few minutes for part two.